Interstellar is the year's biggest movie, partly because of the solid science behind the science fiction. We're going to speak to director Chris Nolan and physicist Kip Thorne, who literally wrote the book on some of the physics behind the film, about how that science operates. This world's a treasure. It's been telling us to leave for a while now. Your daughter's generation will be the last to survive on Earth. So here we have the scientist and the artist, and we're working to conflate these two worlds. Um, so the question I want to ask is, what is the greatest liberty that you felt you had to take with the science in this movie? And what is the greatest veto you ever had to impose when you said you've gone too far with this? Well, the greatest veto is the easiest thing. Um, Chris, Chris and I brainstormed about the science every few weeks while he was working on uh, the screenplay. And uh, on several occasions he said, I need this, I want this. And I would respond, I don't think that can work. And he would say, go think about it. <laughs> I'd go home. I was a little more polite it. than that, by the way. <laughs> I think I said, please. It was please go think Well, it. on one item, you said it's non-negotiable. <laughs> but, but, okay, but, <laughs> but, I, but I would go home, sleep on it, think about it, and I always found a way except once. And Jonah, his brother, had told me, this is near and dear to Chris's heart. <laughs> and uh, he really wants this. And I said, no, it won't fly. There's no way. The laws of physics forbid yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> And we went back and forth for two weeks, and finally he threw in the towel. What Kip's referring to is I had wanted an element of the story where people travel faster than the speed of light. Right. And it was, it was something that was pretty important to me, and right. he made it very clear over a fairly long period of time that um, that is not possible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, I, I, but one of the things, I, I haven't asked you about this since, but you know, after that two weeks of arguing about where I finally <laughs> felt like I gained some understanding of mm -hmm. right. relativity, you know, which is what Kip was taking great pains to explain to me, the relationship between time and gravity and right. mass and everything and all the rest, and sort of got this intuitive sense of, okay, I kind of get why it's not possible. Right. And then I said, yeah, no, it's not possible. And then you immediately said something like, oh, in localized region or something. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Well, I'll give you an example that yeah. violates the speed limit. The universe, after, right when it's born, it expands faster than the speed of light. The right. distant re distantly separated regions that can't communicate with each other are moving faster than the speed of light relative to each other. And it's the speed limit really only applies when you're in a region that is so small that the warping of space and time uh, isn't important. Did you, Chris, come into this movie innately, pre-existingly interested in this kind of hard, head-cracking cosmological physics? And Kip, did you come into this pre-existingly interested in the artistry of the science? Yeah, I mean, to take, to take my end of it, one of the things that's become really apparent to me in making this film and showing it to people is that everything that I know about physics, cosmological physics, and all the rest, I learned when I was 10 years old. I mean, really through watching Carl Sagan's you know, Cosmos. I mean, yeah. You know, in the, after Star Wars came out, right. everything was about space. The space shuttle went up for the first time, late 70s, mm -hmm. early 80s, all that. And I realized that when you're that age, that excitement, Mm -hmm. and your brain is very willing to absorb these ideas, which I never really thought, I never really had such a palpable example in my life of the value of early education. Right. And the value of trying to excite somebody about something that, that early on. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things I'm pleased about with the, the film is, you know, we really try to make it accessible to right. you know, younger kids, 12-year-olds, you know, 10-year-olds, whatever, because I, I think exciting people's imagination at that age. Right. You know, I came into this project really with a fair amount of you know, layman's knowledge, if you like, about right. black holes and things like that, but really from when I was 10 years old. Right. You have a very deep intuition mm -hmm. that I didn't see so much in Jonah, uh, and I don't know where it comes from. Maybe it's from, the, from your 10-year-old experiences, but, but you, you see somehow intuitively things that, uh, that uh, non-scientists rarely see, and you would see things that I didn't see because you had a more open mind, I guess. But uh, this intuitive sense, for a scientist, this kind of intuition is 
absolutely essential if you want to leap over across the, the boundaries of, of human knowledge and make guesses and then test those guesses. You, you, you have to have inspiration and intuition of a sort that you, you have, Einstein had, uh, I have some of, uh, uh, but it is so important for a scientist and it's so wonderful to see it in the artist. Man, it's one of my old textbooks. See, I always love the pictures. It's an old federal textbook. We've replaced them with the corrected versions. Corrected? Explaining how the Apollo missions were fake to bankrupt the Soviet Union. Kip talks about you know, feeling, so having a, to feel something to kind of actually know it. Right. Um, which I, I find very reassuring, mm -hmm. yeah. really, because it's, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's just from the side of it that I come from, but it sort of feels to me like that for something to be true, yeah. there ought to be an element of feeling and intuition. Right. It shouldn't just be hard yeah. math. Right, it can't yeah. just be the calculus. Absolutely. It has to be the viscera. It feels like it, doesn't yeah, it? it? It feels I, you know, right. Yeah. But do you worry at all that some of this will be misunderstood. In other words, again, without spoiling anything, some remarkable eye-popping things happen in the third act of the movie, and you know they may not necessarily move along the lines of the literal, but they do move within the worlds that physics allows. Do you worry at all that people will come away and, as with Star Trek, say, you know, so warp drive is possible, even though that's not in this movie? That well, I think. You know, no one's sort of sitting there in the film and saying everything in this film is perfect and accurate and known mm -hmm. science because the great thing about the scientific method and what I, I really, it was really thrilling to watch Kip yeah. you know, question himself and his, his own things is, you know, science seeking to disprove itself. Right. Just that literally being a scientific method because I would ask him things that I'd read in his, I got from his book mm -hmm. about, you know, black holes, the possibility of naked singularities, those kind of things right. that I wanted to work into the kind of idea of the narrative and I would put these things to Kip and he would he would start arguing with me about them and saying, well, we don't know this, we don't know that. But I got it from your book. Said, this is stuff you wrote. He'd say, yeah, but it doesn't matter. You've still got to do the calculations. You've still got to look at other papers that have come out in right. the years since and see what the current current thinking is. And I, uh, I found that kind of objectivity thrilling. I mean, it's right. what you wish was were in every aspect of our civilization. Well, being, being a physicist, working in an area which is much cleaner in terms of being able to determine whether you're right or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's a very humbling process because right. every day you believe something and then discover you were wrong. Every day. <laughs> yeah. so. Taking sort of the 30,000 foot view, and, and Chris, you and I spoke about this once before, Kip, you and I haven't. <coughs> um, science that's this head-crackingly difficult it's hard to get people interested in. And, you know, if this were, we were having discussions about biology, which actually affects the lives of people, their very health, you couldn't necessarily get them as interested in, in the science as you do when it's cosmology, even though it has no direct bearing on their lives. What is it about cosmology that, though, though it's so not immediately relevant, nonetheless becomes primarily, viscerally relevant to people. No, I think this says something about the human brain, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a deep intellectual curiosity in the human brain, wanting to know about the universe around us. Right. The skies, the heavens, uh, uh, what you've heard, the mysteries of relativity. Right. Uh, and uh, people are just intellectually curious. Yeah. You know, when I, when I ask myself, what are the great things, looking back in history, that we got from the era of the Renaissance? Uh, it's the great art, uh, the great music, uh, the science insights of Leonardo da Vinci, who right. is, when you ask what are the great things, uh, 200 years from now, what are the great things that came from this era? I think it's going to be an understanding of the universe around us. This is culture, right. and it's culture that the human mind and spirit embrace. And I think that's what makes this movie fly. And part of uh, what I think you're, you're getting at, which I actually found very revelatory in mm -hmm. speaking with Kip, just talking with him over, over the months, is you know you take a field like economics, for example, right. it deals with real material right. things, you know, whatever. You can't predict anything. It's completely right. <laughs> <you're> always <laughs> wrong. Um, but you, you take Kip's field, where it's all to us outsiders, particularly, it's all abstraction. It's right. all algebra. It's all thought experiments, things that right. don't seem to bear any relation to our real lives. But, you know, the GPS on your phone only works because of, of this work. Right. It has actual impact on your life, right. you know, materially to do with, you know, that to do with the clocking of satellites right. and the 
difference in their clocking based on relativity. Yeah. So it's it's this very weird disconnect between this, you know, it's almost as if you're dealing with pure philosophy, not right. abstract philosophy, but then it makes your cell phone work. Right. You know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty <laughs> incredible. It's like grand unified theory all over again, <laughs> macro and micro. Yeah, all together. incredible. Well, I thank you, gentlemen. I thank you for the time. I would do this all day if we had the studio time, but I really appreciate your coming here today. Well, thank you. Thank you.